as a way of studying fundamental details about ourselves. A four-letter alphabet makes up the three-billion-letter-long sequence of DNA that, divided into 23 pairs of chromosomes, inhabits the core of each cell in our bodies. Of course, people are not identical, and DNA sequences do differ subtly between individuals. The Human Genome Project is producing a representative sequence. Separate projects are charting variations in the sequence. The representative sequence is a composite from several people who donated blood samples. Originally, close to 100 people volunteered to give blood and gave their informed consent, affirming that they agreed to the study of their DNA. No names were attached to the blood samples, and ultimately scientists kept only a few. These measures ensured that the DNA sequence would remain anonymous. Not even the donors knew whether their samples were actually used or not. The Human Genome Project aims to read, letter by letter, the three billion units of human DNA. The Human Genome Project scientists began large-scale DNA sequencing in 1999. Before starting to sequence the human genome, they built maps of the human chromosomes and developed and refined techniques for analyzing DNA. With the tools in place, genome scientists took just a year to amass sequence covering more than 80% of the genome. The human genome is a massive text. If the three billion letters called bases, that make up all the human DNA in a cell were printed in telephone books, the stack containing the whole genome would reach as high as the Washington Monument. To figure out the sequence of all the bases in the genome accurately, scientists need to read the three billion bases not just once, but at least six to ten times. Sequencing reactions can only reveal the order of a few hundred letters of DNA at a time, amounting to a fraction of a page. Having many overlapping segments of sequence allows the genome to be puzzled back together into an intact whole. Before shredding the DNA in the genome and starting to sequence, Human Genome Project researchers first built a map of the genome. They found thousands of landmarks scattered throughout the chromosomes to help them navigate among all the DNA. Developing genome maps was a key step to prepare for DNA sequencing, but the increasingly detailed maps have also been an important tool orienting hundreds of geneticists hunting for disease genes. With enough markers in place, the Human Genome Project scientists created libraries of clones that span the genome. Each of the clones contains a manageably small fragment of human DNA that is stored in bacteria. Scientists can tell what part of the human genome each clone derives from by figuring out what markers each contains. This clone-by-clone -clone approach for analyzing the human genome makes it possible to double-check the locations of sequence. And because the Human Genome Project has been an international effort, with many laboratories taking part, carving up the genome has allowed different groups to coordinate their work effectively. Clone libraries offer the advantage of real libraries, orderly access to information. In most clone libraries, fragments of human DNA are stored in a kind of bacterium, E. coli, that normally lives in our large intestines. Each E. coli cell in a library stores a single segment of human DNA so that the human fragment can be tracked and copied easily. To sequence the human genome, Human Genome Project scientists cut relatively large clones called BACs, which are 100,000 to 200,000 bases long, into smaller fragments. The smaller fragments, which are about 2,000 bases long, are typically stored in E. coli viruses. The scientists determine the precise order of the larger clones because pinpointing the positions of many smaller clones is much more work. But for actual sequencing reactions, the smaller clones are more suitable. E. coli cells containing fragments of human DNA can be stored in freezers indefinitely.
When researchers are ready to retrieve DNA from the library, they revive the cells by bringing them back up to 37 degrees centigrade, gut temperature. To make many copies of the human DNA, the E. coli cells act as copiers. A few related cells containing the same bit of human DNA inside them are released into a rich, warm broth. Machines shake the broth vigorously, so the cells have plenty of air and divide rapidly, about once every half hour. After a single night, a third of a teaspoon of broth contains billions of copies of E. coli, and so billions of copies of the particular fragment of human DNA they contain. The next morning, the cells are broken up to release the DNA inside. The DNA is separated from the cell debris and washed clean. Now there are enough clean copies of the segment of human DNA to set up a sequencing reaction. A sequencing reaction includes four main ingredients. Template DNA, copied by the bacteria. Free bases, the building blocks of DNA that come in four types. Short pieces of DNA, called primers, and DNA polymerase, the enzyme that copies DNA. The chemical reaction that makes DNA in a test tube is very similar to what happens in a living cell. Both rely on DNA polymerase, and in both cases, DNA strands have a head in, which scientists call the 5' prime end, and a tell in called the 3' prime end. A DNA strand can grow only from its three prime end. Making DNA in cells and sequencing DNA in test tubes depend on one central property of DNA. The building blocks on opposite strands of DNA pair specifically. A C always pairs with a G and an A always pairs with a T. The primer alights on the segment of DNA that matches it. Free bases that match the template sequence can attach to the new strands growing 3' prime end. Among all the free bases swimming in the solution, a few have an extra chemical part. The chemical is a fluorescent dye. When the colored bases attach to the growing strand, the extra chemical part keeps the new DNA strand from growing any further. A different colored dye is attached to each of the four kinds of bases. A completed sequencing reaction contains an array of colored DNA fragments. The shortest are the length of the primer plus one colored base. The longest fragments are usually between 500 and 800 bases long, which is when the sequencing reaction runs out of steam. The products of sequencing reactions are fed into an automated sequencing machine. Sequencing machines have become increasingly sophisticated over the last decade, running more samples, processing them more quickly, and requiring much less labor to set up. The DNA molecules produced in the sequencing reaction are separated by a process called electrophoresis. DNA molecules are negatively charged, the sequencing machine sets up an electric field. All the DNA moves down through a porous gel toward the positive charge. Shorter fragments of DNA move more quickly through the holes of the gel than larger fragments do. In the sequencing machine, a laser excites the fluorescent dyes, and a camera detects the lights that the excited dyes emit. One by one, the sequencing machine reads the DNA molecules passing down the gel and sends the information to a computer. A single sequencing reaction reveals the sequence of a few hundred letters of DNA. A computer program helps integrate the information from individual sequencing reactions. It spots where fragments overlap to puzzle the pieces back together. Many overlapping sequencing reads are needed to reveal the uninterrupted sequence of the original stretch of DNA. On average, every base pair of human DNA will be sequenced nine times.
Some stretches of DNA are easier to read and need to be sequenced a little less often to get high quality sequence. Some stretches need to be analyzed more exhaustively to get finished high quality sequence. To sequence the human genome, scientists will ultimately run more than 50 million reactions. Some 2,000 scientists in more than two dozen labs around the world have worked toward the goal. The Human Genome Project scientists have agreed that whenever they assemble a stretch of DNA that spans 2,000 or more letters, they will send the data within 24 hours to public databases. Anyone with access to the Internet can then see and analyze the sequence. In the spring of 2000, after sequencing the 3 billion letters in the human genome an average of four times, the Human Genome Project had released DNA sequence for 90% of the human genome. This working draft sequence is 99.9% .9 accurate. Some gaps and ambiguities will remain in the representative genome sequence until each letter of DNA has been sequenced approximately nine times. The working draft has just half of that information, so it contains gaps where sometimes just by chance sequence was not obtained for particular regions. Sometimes the chemical properties of some stretches of DNA make particular parts of the genome harder to capture and analyze. There are also many repeated sequences in the human genome that complicate assembling the complete genome sequence accurately. Some repeats are short, some are long, some are present in a million copies, others are repeated only twice. Before the human genome sequence is considered finished, scientists must resolve all ambiguities that can be resolved, and one by one, close all gaps that can be closed with modern sequencing technology. Ultimately, there will be no more than one error per 10,000 bases. In other words, the sequence will be 99.99% accurate. The finished human genome sequence is expected by 2003.